Good morning. And a warm welcome to you to St. Matthew's United Church on this bright spring morning as we continue the season of Easter. I'm very glad to be able to welcome you this day, uh, both those of you who have gathered here in person and also those who are gathering with us in spirit. This is the season of resurrection and new life, new beginnings. And so during our service this morning, we'll be installing three new elders of our congregation and uh, recognizing also our new clerk of session as a congregation. And so I look forward to that and, uh, and to our worship together on this bright and beautiful morning. I would like to ask Anne-Marie Dalton from Earth Spirit Action to come forward to make an announcement, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're giving Elaine a break this week. It's uh, her wedding anniversary. Spring has arrived in our part of the world. It always seems that at this time, the entire earth around us is celebrating. But it's also quite an important and serious time, as quietly, right under our noses, one of the most profound features of our natural world is happening, the production of food. Green plants are cooking. Carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight are the ingredients at the base of every food devoured by virtually all creatures on the planet. This scientific fact has always been, for me, compelling proof of the deep mystery and sacredness of creation. Earth Spirit Action Team is inviting us to focus on food and farmers during this season. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be posting to St. Matthew's website suggestions and reflections about the theme of food, growing food, cooking food, choosing food, remembering stories about food. We will also draw attention to our local farmers by sharing a link to a blog on which farmers report on their experiences and their difficulties, especially in this time of post-pandemic. Our Christian faith has always been intrinsically related to sharing food, especially with those in need. Feeding the hungry is at the core of our ethics and moral life. Perhaps we have not always paid as much attention to the ways in which our faith also calls us to consider the ways in which our food is produced and the consequences of the food industry. So we hope that as a community, we can spend some time this spring thinking about the many aspects of food. To help us along, we are encouraging us all to consider some simple but important actions around food and to share them with each other. So, we have gardeners. Share some of your experiences. Are you planting for butterflies or bees? Do you have tips for newbies to planting? We know that the raising of cattle for meat is quite costly with regard to carbon emissions. Are there steps we might take to reduce meat consumption, especially from large corporate farms? Consider buying local if you can. Have you found some favorite local <coughs> food markets to support? Do you have favorite vegetarian recipes or experience moving to a less meat or a no meat diet? There are some of us, of course, who do not have much choice when it comes to the food we eat. It all comes already prepared. Maybe you have stories from earlier times favorite recipes, stories about learning to farm or cook, or family wisdoms, favorites related to food. We would like to hear them. So, this decorated shoebox will be at the back of the church, and we hope you will write up your stories or recipes or suggestions related to food 
and drop them in this box over the coming days and weeks. We will collect them and arrange an appropriate way to share them with the rest of us. We hope that this can also be a kind of communal sharing during this time when we have limited occasions to do so. To do so. Um, thank you. I'd also like to draw attention to, there are still some copies of Good Tidings, our newsletter at the back of the church. This is the last one uh, from the Easter edition, um, featuring the defiant hope of Easter message from Betsy, uh, as well as an interview with uh, Gail, sitting down here, uh, and other features that you might enjoy. Anyway, if you haven't gotten a copy last week, they're still at the back of the church. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emory, and Earth Spirit Action. Are there other announcements that we ought to hear together in community? Then let us quiet ourselves. Oh, are you announcing something, Ken? Oh, yes, Ken and Kim have a new granddaughter. She's called, she's called Millie Veronica Moores, and she has arrived safely, and Mom Jillian is doing great. And I suspect that Ken and Kim are pretty much over the moon. Are you over the moon? Excellent. <laughs> so welcome to baby Millie. And if we get to do uh, Bethlehem at Barrington this year in person, we have a baby Jesus. <laughs> Yay. All right, I haven't officially asked her yet. But I'm pretty sure she'll say yes. <laughs> Congratulations to the Moores family and the Hartland family. Let us pray. <coughs> God of grace, in this springtime unfolding around us, we thank you for your presence, for your strength, for the courage you give us. We ask you to bless to us this day ahead, this week ahead. Help us to be kind, to be gentle, to be strong and courageous. Help us to reach out to those around us, sharing your goodness in all we do. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 374. Come and find the quiet center, and you'll find the lyrics on the screen. Will you join with me in singing?
please be seated. Our first reading this day is taken from Paul's letter to the Colossians, reading from the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as God has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. Amen. I'm very glad to invite Gail Reiner forward as presiding elder and to ask Ken Moore's Janet Holford and Stephen Mercer to come forward to be installed as new elders of our congregation. of the Congregation of St. Matthew's United Church. I present Janet Hulford, Ken Moores, and Stephen Mercer, who have been appointed to the Kirk Session of our congregation to serve as elders of St. Matthew's United Church, responsible for the spiritual life and work of the congregation, worship, education, outreach, fellowship, and pastoral care. And on behalf of the Kirk Session of Elders of St. Matthew's United Church, I present Ken Morris, who has been appointed to serve as Clerk of Session of our congregation, representing the congregation in its spiritual life and work and in celebrations of communion and baptism. Janet and Ken and Stephen, we celebrate with gratitude the gifts God has given you and your willingness to share them with our congregation as elders. Ken, we give thanks for your willingness to support and nurture the spiritual life and work of our congregation as clerk of session. Janet, Ken, Stephen, as you join the Kirk Session of Elders, Will you promise to oversee, encourage, and support the spiritual life and work of St. Matthew's through worship, education, outreach, fellowship, and pastoral care, thoughtfully and prayerfully, and with openness to God's spirit at work in yourself and others? I ask you all gathered here this day, gathered not only here but in spirit, will you promise to support Janet, Stephen, and Ken in their responsibilities as elders 
and as clerk of session with your prayers, encouragement, and wisdom as together we seek to be a faithful community of Christ Church. If so, you may respond, we will, God being our helper. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, bless our new elders and our congregation as together we continue to be strengthened by your presence and guidance in our faithful living as your people. May we keep the light of your hope and grace at the center of all we do. Amen. The old Presbyterian tradition is to offer the right hand of fellowship. The old Presbyterian tradition did not know about COVID restrictions. So I ask you, uh, by applause, will you join me in welcoming Janet and Ken and Stephen as new elders of St. Matthew's United Church? The right elbow of fellowship. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. Gail, you can stay up here for a moment, if you would, please. And Ken and Janet and Stephen, I wonder if you'd just have a seat. So, Gail has been the chair of worship and music for 17 years. <laughs> Stephen and Janet, it takes two people to replace Gail. Stephen and Janet are new co-chairs of worship and music, but this day, oh yeah, okay. We are really astonishingly lucky. Um, but this day is a day also for giving thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks for all your years of service, Gail, for your gentleness and your wisdom and your insight, all that hard work. Uh, there are almost no words, as a person who tries to make words, there are almost no words to express the gratitude that I feel and that I know the, the uh, congregation feels as well. Thank you so much. we found a pair of St. Matthew's earrings. So we thought we'd give her those two. The second reading this morning continues the stories of the Acts of the Apostles, the early travels of Jesus' first followers after his death and resurrection. Readings from the Acts of the Apostles are traditional in the season of Easter, these weeks following Easter. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When her friends had washed her body, they laid her in the room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who had heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. 
all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. Peter gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling all the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon the Tanner. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of grace, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this week, I found myself thinking a lot about the word legacy. <laughs> this may not surprise you in view of the number of times I've 
heard and said and typed the word legacy this week in relation to our public invitation for development proposals. But what should surprise you in the sense of manifesting that weird Holy Spirit synchronicity that never ceases to amaze me is that the story of the raising of Tabitha that we just heard together, a story utterly grounded in the nature and importance of someone's legacy was just the passage from the Book of Acts that was scheduled for today in the common lectionary that most churches use. In other words, I didn't choose it. It was already there. One of the best stories in the Christian Bible about legacy as crystallization of the meaning of someone's life, as gift bestowed and shared, and as both intertwined together so that the meaning continues to live. The story of Tabitha. That's her name in Aramaic, the sort of Hebrew-adjacent language that Jesus and the disciples would have spoken, while the same name in Greek is Dorcas, which may seem like a sort of throwaway line in this passage from Acts, but in fact what it tells us is that she's connected with and moves within both the Jewish Christian community and the non-Jewish or Gentile Greek-speaking community in Lydda, which is the place where she lives, which suggests that she's a person of some importance in her community, Tabitha. She's called in this passage a disciple. It's the only place in the Bible where the female version of that Greek word is used. So her faithfulness and her discipleship are important in the early church and in her wider community. But we can also tell that she's a person of some importance in her community, quite literally, because the house where she lives has an upper room. We learn that because that's where her body is laid out when she dies, but just the fact of having an upper room, living in a place with two stories, is a mark at this time of a certain degree of affluence. However this happened, whether by birth or by marriage, or less likely but still possible by her own initiative or enterprise, Tabitha is a woman whose life has been shaped by the experience of comfort and affluence. But she's also a woman whose life has been deeply shaped by her faith and the call to care and service that faith inspires. Love one another as I lo have loved you, is how Jesus puts it. And for Tabitha, that's real. It's her essential guiding principle. It's the shape of how she lives. And we know that not because she tells us that, and not even because the writer of Acts tells us that, but because the women of her community who crowd into her house when she dies tell us that. In fact, they tell the Apostle Paul that when they've summoned him to her deathbed. But not just with words, they tell us with things. All these widows pressed together and weeping because Tabitha has died, they've brought with them as precious as a kind of embodiment of Tabitha's care and the concern she's shown them when they've been in need, they've brought with them all these pieces of clothing that she's made for them. Just ordinary clothing, tunics and other garments is what it says in the passage, but every single piece of that ordinary clothing was a gift. Quite literally, a gift, a legacy bestowed that Tabitha has given to them to meet a particular need, but at the same time, also representative of her gift of just caring about them, wanting their needs to be met, wanting for their, wanting for them well-being as children of God. 
wanting to help. In effect, what greets the Apostle Peter when he arrives at Tabitha's house at the behest of the women who love her is Tabitha's legacy in all its layers. There are the things, the gifts, that for these women are just like the things, that gifts that we cherish ourselves because of who gave them to us, because of who they remind us of, who we think of every time we see them. In our house, because we began our married life in what I can only describe as the 1990s Nova Scotia kingdom of toll painting, our Christmas tree is literally a Christmas ornament manifestation of the first congregations that I served down near Kedji, with almost every ornament reminding us every year of the people who made them and made them a gift to us. So there are those things, those reminders, the gifts, the clothing that Tabitha made and gave them, that the women carry with them that day and show in their grief to the Apostle Peter, that aren't just pieces of clothing, but they're pieces of clothing that Tabitha made. And as precious for that reason, as a pink baby sweater that still lives in my house, that's the pink baby sweater that a beloved Isabel made and told me to keep in case the abundance of sons eventually led to a granddaughter. <laughs> Things get filled with meaning. So look, the widows say to Peter, here are the things that Tabitha made for us and gave us. But what they expect and what they assume is that Peter will recognize that these aren't Tabitha's legacy solely in the sense of what's been given, but that he'll also recognize that these are Tabitha's legacy in the sense of crystallizing and representing for them the heart of what her whole life has been about. Because for Tabitha, the meaning of love one another as I have loved you was translated into the direct action, as it were, of good works and acts of charity, like making and giving clothing when clothing was needed. When I was naked, you clothed me, is how Jesus puts it in his teaching to the disciples. And for Tabitha, that's been at the heart of her faithfulness and the faithful living she embraced and also modeled for others. And that's also her legacy, the meaning she manifested. And by manifesting it, she shared it. Because she's identified by the author of Acts with the name of disciple for a reason. Her living was itself a sermon about Christian love in good works and acts of charity. And that sermon was heard by those around her. And in that way, must have snowballed, been extended spread. She'd not have been named a disciple otherwise. There's an acknowledgement in that of the wider import of what might otherwise simply have been what she herself did with her one wild and precious life, as the poet Mary Oliver puts it. But that's not to set Tabitha apart or subside in, to subside into humility or even discouragement in relation to the great legacy that was hers because of its import and because of its breadth. Because at the heart of our faith is the notion of literal incarnation, godness in humanness, this life mattering deeply for all of us in our own little ways. How each of us lives being our own little selves, doing our own little thing, how can we ever know the fullness of our legacy? What we've gifted others, what we've manifested. I mean, just stop and consider all the legacies that we've experienced and received from others in ways not large, not just large, but also small. I often tell the story of one of the first airplane rides that I ever took as an adult 
having made the ill-advised decision to go to school in Vancouver, when I was basically catatonic with fear while we were waiting for the plane to take off. And I felt this little pat on my hand. And the little boy sitting next to me said, don't worry, lady. Everything will be just fine. He's presumably a grown man now, even approaching middle age, I'm sorry to say. And I'm sure he has no memory of this at all, but I will never forget it. I will never forget him. It was such a gentle act of kindness and part of his legacy that's still getting shared because I just shared it. I never pretend to understand intellectually the science-defying miracles we read about in the Bible. Invariably, there are explanations floated that seek to cast them as rational in reality and only mir miraculous if somehow that reality hasn't been noticed. Like the feeding of the 5,000 was really everyone just sharing, but if that's not noticed, it's a miracle. Or Jesus was really walking on a sandbar, not water, but if that's not noticed, it's a miracle. Or if Tabitha wasn't really dead, but just unconscious, but if that's not noticed, then we call it a miracle when she's raised. I have to admit, I don't find those explanations terrifically interesting, but I also don't consider them necessary. Because these aren't stories that are told simply to communicate facts. The Bible is revelation. It's meant to reveal. These are stories that are told to reveal and communicate meaning. And sometimes lots of meaning and layers of meaning and varieties of meaning because that's how stories work and that's their point. I could have told you that very same story about the little boy on the plane in the very same words, but in order to convey the meaning of not only adults, but also children can be wise. Rather than the meaning of how we'll never know what small kindnesses we've shown someone randomly that they'll never forget. So the story from Acts, it begins as a story that's pretty much a funeral. It begins as a story of the layers of the meaning of Tabitha's legacy, not only the love of God and neighbor she's embodied in her living through good works and acts of charity, but also the literal gifts she's given others in the shape of all those pieces of clothing the women have literally brought with them in their grief. It begins as a story of pretty much a funeral of Tabitha's legacy as though it's something she's left behind. But then the story continues. And that's not what it is at all. Because Peter reaches his hand out to her and speaks to her and helps her up and shows her to all who have gathered with all their memories and experiences of Tabitha-ness and the gifts that for each of them mean Tabitha. And that legacy is not dead at all. It's alive in the midst of them, afresh. The Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does, and the goodness and the meaning, they still live and can't be lost. Not for Tabitha's community, and not for us either, held as we are too in the power of the Spirit, and inspired as we try to be too by the power of the Spirit. For I have received what I've also handed on, is how the Apostle Paul puts it in one of his letters to the early church. Thanks be to God by whose spirit legacies of goodness abide and continue. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, faithful guide, we don't pretend to understand the mystery of your presence. We only know that somehow, in waves of gratitude, 
in flashes of beauty, in a still small voice in the long night. It's real, and we are not alone. We thank you for the legacies of others, of faithful service, passion for justice, and gentle kindness that have shaped our own living. We thank you for the gift of our own lives and the ways our lives, too, have been made meaningful. On this day of remembering and celebrating those who have mothered us in many ways, we thank you for legacies of goodness. Hold us in your spirit, we pray, O oh God, and hear this day our prayers for our earth and its people. We pray for those in Ukraine, in the Middle East, for an end to violence. Trusting in your comfort and blessing, we pray to you for all who are ill, for all who are afraid and shaken to their core. We pray for all who are grieving this day, for all whom we love, and we pray for ourselves. Watch over us, O oh God, bless and guide us. Hear our prayers this day. For we pray with trust as Jesus taught us, and together in the words that he gave us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn this day is One More Step Along the World I Go. It's in the hymnary at number 639, but the lyrics will be on the screen. Will you join me in singing? <laughs>
us go forth into the newness of this day, into the newness of this week, to seek justice and to love kindness and to travel humbly together in God's path. And let us go forth knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit rest within us and lift us up this day and always. Amen.